the reason we have the white Jeep pulled up next to us and we're using its hose is because this also has an ARB dual compressor. It's just, it's run by our S-Pod, which this is our original Jeep. So the S-Pod on this Jeep is run by a touchscreen and that touch screen over the last year or two has kind of degraded to the point of, I guess on this trip, I just, it was working before we started this trip, but now it seems to have stopped working. Um, we can't run our KC lights or this currently, since all of that is wired into and controlled by that S-Pod touch screen. I think it's a pretty simple fix. It's either just get a new S-Pod, which isn't a big deal, or we would just change to what we have in the white Jeep Worsley is an S-Pod HD panel. So it's like actual buttons, which I've actually come to like more. As cool as having a touch screen version is and you can do custom buttons and all that, uh, having just actual pushing buttons, you can actually turn on the lights faster or off faster. And then you know it's not gonna malfunction unless something goes wrong with the buttons. It's a little, little less fragile than a touch screen. Nice. Beats the old way of doing it. It used to take us about half an hour to air up. Air up. The ones we use now are called they're speed plates. Um, so you can do all four tires at once. It just has connecting hoses, like one with an elbow, and then you go around to the other tire. So you can do all four at once. The best thing to do is, uh, before you start using a speed plate, is to equalize all of your tires perfectly. That way you know every time you plug in now, they're going to be doing it perfectly equal. Really convenient once you get that all dialed. With all our tires now aired back up to highway pressures, we jumped onto the James Bay Road and began the 1,200 kilometer or 745 mile journey back to the cabin. Before long, the fuel problems we were having with Vandy began to act up again, and we soon found ourselves stalled out on the side of the road. It could be as simple as just fuel, but um, hopefully it's nothing more than that. We're heading back now to check. fuel gauge situation isn't uh, isn't the best. We just got on the highway here, or we've been going for like an hour or so, and then we got a fuel light like five minutes ago and then it died. We had to pull over, completely ran out of fuel. It's just weird. It's not, uh, I don't think it's reading accurately, either the actual stock tank or something to do with uh, an, that airlock might be causing this. It's just not, uh, not the best thing ever. Well, that's good news. That was a very simple fix. Uh, they just ran out of fuel, and uh, we filled them up from the uh, caddy, and we're back on the road. Everyone's hungry, so it's time for lunch. We're gonna find a place to pull over and make some food. After a quick bite to eat, we continued on down the road. But first, Mom had a very special stop she wanted to make. So we were here about a week ago or so, and um, I found an antler down around this pond. Oh boy, a moose antler, a massive one. And then I saw this odd shape. I didn't know what it was, so I asked, you know, the boys and Pete, we're like, well, what if it's something like sacred, you know, or something like that? We just couldn't figure it out what it would be there for. I'll, I'll just leave it here. So it looks like a ceremonial uh, display. So, but it's pretty neat. Always gets your heart pounding. Later, as we kept driving and I left the antler there, not knowing, um, we kept on seeing them everywhere around all the ponds. And come to find out, um, it is for like hunting ducks or geese and, and things like that. So I came back here and I'm gonna go and see if it's still sitting here. If not, well, at least it was a cool find. But if it is here, Whew, it'll be really cool. So it's an old one, but it was beautiful. So let's go see. Look at that thing. Sweet. Congratulations. You got another <laughs> moose in there. Thank you. Well, this is neat. It's special, especially with this trip and how far we've come. And my neck can finally be relaxed because <laughs> for how many <clears throat> kilometers has it been? Um, a lot, and she mentions it every two hours. Man, I should have grabbed that that antler. Is that nice? <laughs> the engine just shut off on its own, so. So we made it 
all the way to the fuel station, but now the engine is stalled, so it could be a little more serious than fuel. Just put in like four gallons and drove for half an hour. We were able to get Vandy refueled and back on the road, but we were becoming a little concerned with the fact that it was stalling out more frequently and we still had a long way to go. So we just completed the Billy Diamond Highway after the trans -Tiaga. It's a long drive. Like we're going to be pulling into uh, Matagami soon. But it's just neat to go back through the sign. Didn't know what to expect and we definitely weren't let down on the beauty and uniqueness of a trip like this. Just going so remote because the beauty is different than what you typically go out to go do. Like when you're going out on a Jeep trip, if you have a week of time or two weeks of time to travel like what we're doing now, you'd kind of picture in your head you'd want to go see mountains in BC or beautiful deserts and you know stuff like that or the ocean but going out to do something like this is just really long drives technically and it's all just forest but you really get a sense of what it's like in the north especially in the north of Canada obviously you're so far from civilization and from people it was crazy when we were back on the Billy Diamond Highway from the Trans Niagara because there was other cars, which was kind of a, a sight yet we hadn't seen in like three, four days. And especially when you get out to the end, we didn't spend too much time out at the very end of the Trans Tiaga because of our fuel situation. But uh, if you spent a couple days out there, you're basically guaranteed not to see another person. And you could probably stay out there for three weeks and not see anyone unless there's another traveler. So it's a really cool experience and some, something definitely worth doing and worth checking off as an overlander that you've done the loneliest road in North America. We topped up our fuel in Metagamy, found a camp spot for the night, and then got an early start back on the road the next morning. Back to civilization now, huh? Let's keep the bugs off since there's so many. Is that behind you, Dan? Timmy's. <laughs> we are back in civilization and uh, first stop we're getting fuel and right behind us is a Tim Horton so we're gonna coffee up and get back on the road. Lando, could you have a fun trip? We encountered a few more fuel related problems on the rest of the journey home and then with our driveway coming into sight the engine quit and we began to coast our way in. We made it back. What an incredible time we had in Northern Quebec, making memories and experiences that we will never forget. That was crazy. It stalled what, a mile back, and I was going enough speed, I rolled right in. <laughs> I just kept her going. Coming in here, it, it you know how the uh, power steering and the power brakes went off, so I just muscled it around and in. We made it, that's an unbelievable adventure come to a crazy completion, but we did it. We absolutely love our off-grid lifestyle. Whether we are exploring a remote road somewhere in the wilderness, or enjoying life at the cabin, the wilderness makes us feel fully present and alive. It's a biggie. Not bad. Not bad. Look at that thing. Yeah, there it goes. Beep. Wow. That thing that's huge. That's Two crazy. massive bass in the same line <laughs> in like three minutes apart. We just got back from an epic trip up north and the garden's looking good and it's exciting to be back and check out everything and now that things are blooming and it's just is so beautiful but I got the tumble test going and I'm making moose burgers with a little bit of pork blended in with it. I'm gonna be using some applewood pepper in with it and some nice bacon and stuff like that so it's gonna be nice. It's the perfect beginning of summer meal, I think. So let's get started. So this is really thoughtful of our neighbor on the lake and a good friend of ours. Um, especially when you come back from a, a big trip like that and he came over with um, the pork, the moose hamburger and bacon and buns and it was just such a treat. So that was really nice. 
like I said, really thoughtful. So we are all pretty hungry and this is going to be amazing, I think. You said you add in um, a little bit of pork to your moose hamburger because it's um, very lean. So this is my first making moose hamburgers. I think that apple smoked espresso pepper will be really nice touch to this. Look at that. Beautiful. We got Vandy into the Jeep dealership for service and there was a couple of issues uh, they believe we haven't tested it yet but they said it's running fine and um, it was called a camshaft sensor or something along those lines which uh, they replaced and reset everything and then they did a full uh, engine cleanup you can see the uh, spark plugs are were kind of worn out broken actually so uh, replace the plugs flushed out the fuel injectors and all that kind of stuff so let's hope that's all it was I think uh, I'm gonna go try start it and I think you know we're probably in good shape ready for our next trip good morning guys as you probably heard a bunch of wildfires broke out in Quebec and Ontario uh, thankfully since then we've had three lovely days of slow drenching rain and so the fire bans have been lifted and I think a lot of the fires are under control if not completely out now but it made us uh, think, what's our state of preparedness for uh, a wildfire if one were to happen on the island, uh, God forbid, but anywhere on the lake. So we're quite a distance from any, any fire hall of any kind and it would take some time for a water bomber to fly in. So we need to be our own first responders. So we do have a pump and some uh, brush fire line and a nozzle. So, and we have lots of water. That's one thing we have an unlimited supply of. So. We're gonna just, Dan and I are gonna grab the pump and see how long it takes us to get uh, water coming out of the end of the nozzle. So we leave the pump primed in the summer. In the winter, of course, we drain it, but 
that just makes it easier to use. Try to leave it fueled up and pre-primed so it's ready to go. I see uh, the water hitting the pump now, and here we go, we're charged. And putting the fire out. Now you can rev it up a lot more than this. So if we're just trying to soak down an area, you can shoot it right up into the canopy of the trees. We're getting up there a good 50 feet into the air and in preparation for a fire that was advancing towards us, I would uh, just soak everything, soak the trees, at the same time, the ground would be getting soaked. If you're fighting a, like a grass fire or a brush fire that's close by, you put this on a nice wide nozzle like this, and you get the biggest area possible. And you can just douse the fire in no time. But yeah, this allows us to get a high volume of water. I'd soak the buildings, the ground, and the trees, and just uh, get as much water on everything as possible to be able to put out a brush fire pretty quick with this. knock down a pretty big fire with that and uh, the nice thing I was saying earlier we could throw this whole rig into a, a boat head across the lake put a fire out somewhere else we also have two more 75 foot rolls of this uh, inch and a half uh, brush line so we could go like 200 plus feet into the into the bush run around putting out spot fires so pretty good I think our test was successful now uh, if we keep up with this nice cool and damp weather uh, wildfires aren't going to be much of a problem this year. While we were practicing our wildfire suppression skills, Mom was busy picking up a load of organic meats to top up the freezer for the next six months or so. I just went and picked up another load of some organic meats and some also some organic cleaners that I order from this company here in Ontario. Um, it's just really helpful to just get it all at one time so it's less shopping trip and driving and such like that. We did get um, our hunting license so we're going to be adding that this next fall so hopefully I can get a tag for a moose or a deer this year. That would be really fun to learn that kind of stuff and harvest our own meats. It would be really rewarding and true organic right we did have a few things left over from the whole winter yeah for five people and when the ice didn't freeze up we were eating breakfast lunch and dinner and snacks and then when people would come we could also feed them as well like really nice steaks or ribs and things so 
It went a long way, so I was really, really happy about that. So after coming back from the trans Tiaga trip and with some plans to do more traveling around uh, the east coast of Canada, especially in Ontario, which is also known as the land of lakes, we have so much freshwater lakes and rivers here. Um, we've just been camping alongside them and really wishing we had something to go out on, like a canoe or a raft. So we ended up picking up a alpaca raft. Um, and we haven't set it up yet, so I'm gonna do that now and kind of see how it looks and then maybe take it for a little test. The reason why we got one of these is they just pack so small because we've seen a couple other models that, you know, can go up on roofs and stuff. But since uh, an overlanding space is key, an inflatable one seemed like the way to go. From what I understand, how you inflate it is with this bag and you just inflate the bag with air and then you squeeze the air into the kayak. Before I start inflating it, I'm just gonna turn this around because the wind is coming from this direction. So you kind of just open the bag as much as you can and then grab it closed. I didn't get much air that time, but this is a basic thing. Then this fills with air, and you just squeeze it into the raft, and then rinse and repeat that. Until you inflate the raft. You have the wind at your back like this really helps get a lot more air in with each pump. It's about as much air as it's gonna go in there. And then uh, even though it's pretty much fully inflated just to get the last bit of air and you just blow in uh, with your mouth and then it should be good to go. Well, that was easy. Uh, that's actually, that only took like 10 or 12 pumps and I'm not even sure I was doing the bag as uh, good as you could but that's actually faster than most of the electric ones we've used, which is pretty amazing. But it's also weightless. That's awesome. Another pretty neat thing about these is they're actually handmade in the States, but uh, they have tons of different models. This one is, I believe, their caribou model. Um, so it's designed to be able to carry a frontal load of whatever you're taking if you're going on like a backpacking trip or something. Well, I'm really excited to take this out, uh, even up here to go fishing, but then also when we're on the road, uh, can finally take something out to go explore some of those remote lakes and maybe do some fishing up there as well. But uh, these ones are designed for bike, uh, for hunters as well to carry your loads and also bike packers, people that travel on bicycles. If you ever need to go across a river or a lake, you can just set your bike up front and take to the water, which is pretty neat. One thing I forgot to mention as well is there's this seat that you just fill up by blowing into this tube. But uh, yeah, let's go take it out.
without falling in. Alrighty. Well, I'm not uh, much of a kayaker, so the paddle style is quite a bit different. It's definitely something to get used to from coming from canoes, but and this thing is agile even in the wind, like a slight paddle strokes and you start really moving, which is nice. I'm actually very surprised at how stable I feel in here. Usually with inflatables, you always feel like you're going to tip over, but even if I tried, it'd be hard to. And the seat and backrest is really comfortable as well. And even uh, for taller people like us, it's more than enough room for my legs to fully stretch out. It's really nice. Have to go out on a extended trip with this thing. Hopefully like a couple day camp trip, fishing trip or something around the lake with this. It'll be awesome later on. the light awesome now we got a way to explore even further into the, the wilds when we're out on our trips it's awesome now that I've been back I have been working in the gardens again, one of my favorite things to do. Um, this year is not uh, abundance of variety of things, but at least we have a garden. I started with some green onions, kale, and then lots of peppers, because you know I like to cook with jalapenos and bell peppers. And then this I did plant last fall, and this is my garlic. And it's uh, turning out really nice, I'm excited about that. And this area, as you saw last fall as well, the beets love this and the radishes. I wish it was a little bit bigger so I could add carrots to this um, garden. And if you're wondering about all these sticks, <laughs> they're everywhere because Lando is so used to just running through the gardens and then he rips all the plants up and I have to start over. But he's, he's slowly learning. I think in another week or two, he'll just stay right out of them. But um, I got this because I have strawberries down by the water, but I think I want them hanging here. And I wish it was long enough. I'll, we'll build one next year, but I think for this year, we'll just move them up here. So I think that'll be nice. And then herbs all along the top. And then right here, I have my rhubarb and asparagus. So that'll be coming up for next year's season. And a few Brussels sprouts and then my tomatoes along here. I only went with three plants. I want to like learn more about them and just kind of separate them a lot more this time. And then here in this garden that we have Lando proofed, um, we have some broccoli and a lot of Brussels sprouts. I think I'm going to take out like two rows and do carrots and we have some acorn squash and spaghetti squash. But yeah, so that's why all the sticks are here. It's because Lana likes to lay in here. But also I'm gonna get the Brussels sprouts growing upright that way and uh, get them trained up. So that's what is going on so far. I have no potatoes this year, but I may start some in containers that way. But I have uh, raspberries and strawberries all down there and my blueberries, wild ones, so. I've also been kind of just making the the place around the cabin a little bit more cozy with ferns and hostas and down on the slope by my red chairs I am trying to grow a lot of wildflowers because I really want to learn how to use wildflowers 
as more of like a herbal medicines. I, I'm pretty fascinated by that and I have a lot of learning with that. But yeah, so that's all down there and it's all done by seed, but they're all coming up nicely. So I think that's gonna be a good spot to keep on adding every year to that, um, the wildflower garden. So now it's kind of fun to see it playing out and you know, I'm sure I'll have uh, trial and error, but to just kind of have a map of the property where you know different um, gardens are gonna be going. So it's really fun. Well, happy Father's Day, Dad. Thank you for being such a great example and for always taking the time to teach us stuff and for all the adventures we've had along the way, for all the lessons you've taught us and for always being there. And to all the other fathers out there, we wish you a happy Father's Day as well and a wonderful weekend. Happy Father's Day, Dad. I love you so, so much and I'm so unbelievably thankful. I could write an entire book of all the things that I'm thankful for you and everything that you mean to me. Um, you are truly the best dad in the entire world. And something that I'm super thankful for is that you have been an example and shown me what is truly possible in life when you dream big enough and work hard enough towards that dream and keep that goal in front of you because anything is truly possible when you are willing to work hard enough for it. and. I am so thankful for all of the years of hard work and just dedication to building those dreams for our family and the life that you've given us. It has truly, truly been a dream and all of the experiences and memories together and the lessons I've learned, it is so unbelievable. Um, and you are also a true example of selfless, unconditional love. and. Yeah, I love you so much, Dad. I could keep going and keep going, but yeah, just happy Father's Day. Join us next week as we set out on another overland adventure into the backcountry of Ontario, Canada.